start. Hello, everyone. My name is Maureen McDowell. I'm the founder and executive director of Keep St. Pete Lit. We are a literary arts organization located in St. Petersburg, Florida. And this is episode 11 of Typewriter Talks. Typewriter Talks is a weekly online series where we showcase Tampa Bay writers and poets and kind of go into their brains and see um, what makes them tick. And today we have Pedro L. Poeta. Thank you so much, Pedro, for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Maurice. Yeah, Pleasure. so we've known each other for a while um, around the spoken word poetry scene. Uh, you were the host of the poetry open mic at the Studio 620 for several years. Um, and then we took it over about three years ago. There was a bit of a gap, but that's where I met you, I believe, is at the Poetry Open Mic. So you've been on the spoken word scene for uh, over a decade now or longer, right? 2001 in St. Pete. 2001, so, yeah. Going on, going on two decades deep now, so. Yeah, yeah, I moved back to St. Pete from Asheville uh, in 2002, so around the same time. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, tell us what you're working on right now. Uh, right now I'm, I'm working on um, some music. Um, when this whole, you know, backlash from George Floyd incident happened, Mm -hmm. it kind of just brought the, the country into like a moment of grief and a moment of pain. And that's, you know, it was a very big, big, big moment and we're still feeling it. So a lot of what I'm doing right now is kind of focusing on, on that, addressing some issues that, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been silent on for a bit and that need to get addressed. And yeah. so that's kind of what I'm working. I had a couple of artists reach out to me and I reached out to some artists um, to try to get, you know, work with different people and try to get the community on board with, we have to speak out, you know, it's yeah. kind of our duty as, as poets, as writers, as musicians. Um, so that, that's, that's what I'm working on right now. Just a couple, a couple new songs to uh, put out. I just released one a couple of weeks ago and I'm looking to release one in the next week or two um, as well. So. so you still, have you moved more into music? You still do spoken word because I mean, you know, <laughs> lyrics is poetry. So. Yeah, you know, they go, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, yeah. For example, I was, I was working on a, a, the song that I told you I just released recently, uh, maybe two weeks ago. It, it's a poem if you don't have the music to it. So for example, I was asked to speak at City Hall um, for the first uh, protest uh, slash march that happened. And I recited it as a spoken word piece. Cool. Um, and and it's, it, it's really kind of seamless, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, because I've always kind of, my delivery has always had a touch of hip hop in it. Yeah. So, so it translates well, so. And that's good for youth to see also, because I, I don't know if, um, you know, some, some kids are like poetry, ugh. Right. But like when you, when, you, when you show them, like you're listening to poetry all the time with music you're listening to. Right, it's just disguised, you know? It's disguised, <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, even we've, we've done that with workshop with kids where we have them bring in their favorite song and have them pick out a lot, either I have them rewrite the song in their own words, or even find a line in the song and inspire that, have that inspire a new poem. So I think that it's kind of the gateway drug in a lot of ways for kids. It is, and you know, a lot of, because the vernacular is different when you talk about those things, um, it does get lost in, in, in translation where they don't, they don't see him as the same thing. And I remember kind of feeling like that at some point in my life too. You know, like, I don't, I don't want to write poetry. I want to, I want to be a rapper, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I actually stopped rapping and just started writing poetry. And I really liked the escape of it and um, what it did for me. Um, so I started doing that. And then I realized that I had still had this cadence when I was writing my poetry. So I was like, maybe they're synonymous. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> you get this big aha moment, you know, like I'm still writing poetry, you know? Yeah. So, so it's, it's cool. It's cool to have the realization, but, but you're right. It, it's good for, for, for kids. And, you know, me being a teacher too, yeah. um, that I put a lot of value in, in words. Um, even, even, even though it's musical and, it, and it's rap, they listen to it. They're like, man, you're saying some stuff. And I was like, not enough people are, you know what yeah. I mean? So, Amen. So you're bilingual, correct? Uh, yes, I speak uh, a couple more than two, but uh, two primarily, and then I'm, um, I'm mostly fluent in Portuguese as well. So does that inform your writing at all? Do you... Um, absolutely. The um, way you think about words too, so... Absolutely. I think having a, um, 
Spanish was my first language. You know, I had to I had to teach myself English. I had to learn English. And the foundation of Spanish really helps when you're thinking about stuff in English. Because I always, when a word is hard to spell, mm -hmm. I've trained my mind to to say it out in Spanish because oh, Spanish is a phonetic language. Mm -hmm. So it kind of like I can I can ver visualize it in Spanish and then I can spell it right in English. It's kind of it's kind of weird, but the richness in, in in different languages and you know words that you don't have for one language yeah. um, kind of allows you for more fluidity of expression. Mm -hmm. um, because you can think in concepts that weren't native to what the way your language develops, you know, like the way that Eskimos have, you yeah. know, yeah. a dozen words for snow. Um, you know, we have in Spanish more words for love than mm -hmm. in English, for example. You know, um, you can tell someone te amo, you can tell them te quiero, you can tell them, you know, different ways of saying things. So it kind of does open your mind up to maybe I'm, I'm, I'm able to say this in different ways than I think I can. Mm -hmm. you know and it just creates that opportunity to grow in your writing so so absolutely it has influence and it's it's unfortunate that it's not um required for you like we take like a couple a little bit of either spanish or french in school right but, you know how fortunate um you know they say like don't make fun of someone if they're not speaking english because they're on their or they're speaking broken english because they probably they know more languages than you do <laughs> right, right, right. usually you know and it's like how unfortunate it is that we're not raised in this country to you know it's required to know another language yeah and and you see the huge difference that makes um i lived in spain for a while um and i think on average the average person because i was in this group called erasmus was for all the international students they were mostly from different places in europe the average person that i befriended there I would say spoke on average five five languages. I know, right? You know? And it's like th that's where my kind of like so I started learning, you know, French. I took two years of French in college, and I was like, I need to do this. I started going, you know, visiting Portugal a lot, learning Portuguese, um, you know, studying some Italian, just to kind of like I wanted to I wanted to be able to say that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it just seems like we're we're conditioning ourselves to keep ignorant, you know, mm -hmm. by not not doing taking those measures to, to you know have a and not have a larger world view other than like the great america right. <laughs> um right. so tell us about your writing process how do, how does how do you get inspired like is it a, is it a lyric you hear is it a word is it an event it, it's it's kind of a mix of everything and it depends kind of on the times like uh i had not written i think in several months at least hadn't written anything um i saw that that video of george floyd and it it moved me i couldn't and, watch it. and now it's like a a flood you know like the, yeah. the gates are so and now i'm writing all the time yeah um sometimes it's that you know um little events that spark up like oh my gosh i need it i need to either do something say something or capture this moment at the very least um, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's other music, you know, uh, you know, some new song comes out and I listen to it and I'm just like, you know, that's, that's a cool topic I haven't ex explored or something like that. And it, and it gets me thinking and that creates more, you know, gets the creative juices, um, coming out a little more. So it, it can be a, a combination of everything. I think I've moved away, you know, over the past few years from getting inspired by other um writers mm -hmm. and um recently i've been reading uh, more stuff mm -hmm. and it's been re-influencing me and i'm just like i needed to remember why yeah. i let other authors inspire me you know and i was just uh, you know i was reading just some words you know just even like speeches by angela davis you know things like that just just some words that i want you know of power that have power in them um mm -hmm. and, and those people that came before and have utilized their voice to to create that power those are the ones that we can learn from to see how we can use our own voice yeah and um power with that so and like what what is in in what she says or any of these great leaders what is it that they say that gives you the goosebumps that really resonates with you and you know that's, what, their, that's go ahead their understanding of uh multifaceted approaches to to situations and issues um, it's very easy to be online on Facebook or Twitter or whatever your platforms are 
and see this this two sided conversation. Yeah. You know? And we've almost we're almost kind of conditioned to those two sided conversations in, in 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 this country because you know we're run by a two party system. You know, um, a lot of people just see things as it it is or it isn't. You know, it's black or white. Um, you know, you either racist or you're not. People don't see that there are implicit things. There are different ways you can look at it and approach a situation. That's what I love when, when they speak because these are ideas that I don't, I'm not, I haven't been around. Angela Davis, for example, she's been doing this for over five decades, you know, being an activist and a spokesperson for, for those in need. And she has so much wisdom yeah. that I can only fathom, you know, or not even fathom, like I, I can only hope to, 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 to be half as, as wise as her um, at her age, you know? Um, but it's those things. It's their different view, like you said, world views that, yeah. that they have experienced that it makes you see the world a little different. Like, oh, I was looking at these angles, but I missed these angles. Mm -hmm. And those are the angles I need. We all, those are the sort of conversations that we, that we are having. And, and they aren't because we're just so, you're right, you're wrong, you're right, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Instead of just being like, you're right about this, but have you thought of this view, yeah. you know? Um, you're wrong about that. And I was wrong about that for a long time until I started seeing it like this. Um, and it's those conversations we need to have. And that's why I look for inspiration. For people. And you, I can, I've seen you like when you're, um, you know, you lead, lead a, when you were leading spoken word, you have that kind of communal spirit. Like, you know, you, you have that energy that you want everyone to feel included. And, and that is what a leader does. I mean, you inspire people to think beyond where they're at, you know, like, uh, you manage with your left brain, your left brain, but you inspire, you lead with your right brain, you know, the creative side, the innovative side, this is something that is possible. This is something we all can work towards. And I, I think at a base level, everyone wants to feel safe. They want their children taken care of. They want to be able to pay their bills. We want love and security. Um, and I think if you can find a way to kind of wrap that in and, and, and inspire from that place. Um, I mean, the sky's the limit, really. But, right, and you know. I think you, the key word you said there, and thank you, I appreciate the compliment. The key word you said there was inclusive, inclusive, you know? Yeah. To be inclusive, I think that's that's one of my main goals when I started hosting back then, and now that I'm, you know, taking, you know, my activist role a little more um, as a teacher, you know, I'm, yeah. I've also been, you know, I started teaching 12 years ago. so. It's, it's making everybody feel like they are in a safe place, that they're welcome, and that their voices are welcome. Yeah. You know? um, and that's, I think, the very important part. And it, I think the best feeling for me in the past two decades have been all the people that have come up to me like, I never wrote poetry before you. Mm -hmm. Or like, I oh, never yeah. even, even been to a poetry show. Now they're running poetry shows, mm -hmm. you know? And it's those moments that I'm just like, yes, small little victory. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, because now they can pass that that on that that you know excitement that you get when you're with a bunch of people sharing your most intimate thoughts, ideas, and, and moments, and yeah. you feel loved instead of judged. Yeah, and that's the kind of spaces that I like to try to create. If I, if I'm able to. and and even as an advocate, like when you're, you know. You're, you're a community advocate, you're out, you know, right now, especially on the streets every day, but also you're teaching children uh, and, and even adults how to advocate for themselves. And that's the, that's the power of poetry and of, of, of the written right. word, because, you know, right. they're able to believe that their voices matter and, and that, you know, there is a platform for them. Even if it is small, um, it's a start. And then, then, then that translates into like, they advocate for themselves when they're applying for jobs. They advocate for themselves at city council meetings. They advocate right. for themselves on the steps of city hall, you know? Yeah. Of your voice, you know? Yeah. So, and I love the shirt you have on, we will not be silent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what I, are, I had on a different one, but I'm literally still soaked from the march. I came straight from the march. Yeah. To it's all good. It's perfect though. Um, so what are some of your major themes? Um, I've, I tackle a lot of um, just uh, like oppression a lot. Um, you know, for a long time, I was known as the love poet. Like that's what <laughs> I was, like, so much love poetry. And of course, you know, I was in my teen courting days and, you know, trying to impress the ladies. And I remember um, my freshman year at Eckerd College, one of my professors still to this day, you know, one of my favorite uh, professors, um, Scott Ward, he says to me, 
or to the class he addressed, it was only like 12 of us, his creative writing class, you know, it was an elective class. He was just like, he had this Southern draw. Why do poets write poetry? He posed this question and everybody raised their hand and gave a different answer. And he shocked the hell out of all of us with his answer. He's like, it's to get laid. That's <laughs> Everyone starts doing it, and then yeah. it might become something else. But everyone starts it together. And I just women, as as Robert Williams said, is in Dead Poet Society. Right. <laughs> so, like, so I start, you know, thinking about that. Yeah, that makes sense. Why I was in love. <laughs> That's funny. And then I started. I'm trying to remember it. You know, at what point, um, I started kind of switching over and, and getting a lot more politically minded. And conscious-minded with with my work. You have um, that, you have that one poem about your um, cousin or brother that committed suicide or got shot. That, that got a uh, he got a um, sent to prison for murder. For he came in and um, his mom had a gun in her mouth, and out of to defend her, he killed his stepfather. Yeah, and he was 15 years old. They sent him to to prison. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a power, it's a powerful piece. But but even within that, you know what I mean? It's it's like I'm fighting for his cause. Like why did it yeah. why did it get seen like that? Why did he get thrown to prison? Why did no one uh, uh, you know address the, the domestic violence that was going on yeah. uh, in the house? Why did no one address, you know, the his his rights as a child, 15 year old child getting thrown yeah. into prison? You know? um, so there are a lot of issues within that. Yeah. that that I that I wanted to 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 bring up and I think that might have been the first poem where I tackled something really serious mm -hmm. actually might have hit the the nail on the head on that one mm -hmm. uh, but then it's kind of hard to go back oh yeah <laughs> from, from love. Thinking, <laughs> poems, you know and I'll still write me a love poem here and uh. there, but, you know, mostly you know no one ever hears it that I write it um, but yeah, so so I think that uh, a lot of my main topics now are a lot of just more serious issues. Uh, there's a lot of rap out there rapping about all the crap. You know what I mean? There's there's a lot of rap about violence or rap about, you know, women and, you know, drugs and this and this and that. And it's just like, I don't want to represent that. Yeah. Um, I want to represent all the, the the people who aren't rappers, who aren't expressing their, their viewpoints. That's not the average person's experience, yeah. which are hearing a lot of music. And I think that we can't um, be blind to the fact that there, there are a million unheard voices with experiences that none of us can relate to or haven't experienced, you know? Um, so I think that's why I do that, so. So what would you tell your younger writer self? My younger writer self? Um, Advice. Keep reading. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was inspired by, you know, Pablo Neruda and, you know, Federico Garcia Lorca. Mm -hmm. uh, Nieto, like really, really, you know, powerful voices. And then on top of, you know, they teach you all the stuff in school. And I'm not gonna I'll mention all the Robert Frost and all the stuff that you oh, learn yeah. in school. We're all made to do that. My my passion came when I started learning about other poets mm -hmm. and how their culture saw their place in that in the literary movement different. You know what I mean? Um, and I and I love that. I love do international literature where you where you're getting to see these these different you know, world, and I think those writers were some of the ones that were addressing some of these bigger issues and inspired me, you know. Um, the Charles Bukowski is also are great mm -hmm. because, you know, you can't have everything be too serious. So you gotta, you gotta throw in some levity in the mix. And, and um, uh, that's what I would, I would say, discover more. That's what I would say to myself, discover more literature so that you can thus be a better, more, you know, uh, developed writer. Yeah, and, and it's unfortunate because, like, I, I could be wrong on this um, um, estimate, but I think only 3% of um, uh, literature is translated to English from other countries. Like, yeah, there's a very small. Need, yeah, there's such a need from, for translators, and it's, it really is only somebody that they just love the, a book so much that they decide to translate it. So it's like, there's so much literature out there that English speaking. It, English, it's once again having a small world view that we're not right. even exposed to. Um, and, it's, and even yeah. if you, even artists that are translated, like I'll give you an example, Paulo Cuello, right? Yeah. Um, he's a Portuguese uh, writer. And you might have heard of like The Alchemist or yeah, you might yeah. have heard of his mm -hmm. books, right? So, so you're familiar with the author, but you 
probably have never heard his poetry or his songs, you know? And because I can read Portuguese, it, it's like a whole world of stuff out there by the same author, but he's so, his voice is so different when he's writing poetry and songs than yeah. when he's writing a book, you know what I mean? And that kind of stuff too, we don't think about like, oh, what am I missing out on from these yeah. great minds out there? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That's one thing that's been nice about, I mean, if you could say there's something nice about COVID, um, I have been reading <laughs> so much. Like I'm like I'm like I, I'm I'm finishing books and I'm picking up another book and I'm reading and I'm put, it's like I've gotten my reading habit back and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I mean I used to read like constantly and I and it, it really is like you know how do you want to live your life and reading is just like one of the best ways to live your life I think because you you're really you're traveling the world and you're getting like just you know so much information in such a short period of time. That you wouldn't get out there bar hopping or <laughs> you know i do miss live music i really miss live music i know i haven't been on a stage in so long i know i got like stage rust go building up you know oh well you're on stage now with the i see you with your megaphone at the yeah um, yeah yeah do i do still get to, to use my voice so that's yeah that's so what are you reading right now right now i'm i uh, just started just Mercy. I wanted to read the book before oh, yeah. I saw the film. I heard the film was very powerful, but you know, mm -hmm. it's always good to get the, the, the word straight from there. Um, and a, a lot of what I've been doing right now is uh, research. Yeah. Um, because of now we have the whole world observing right now this systemic failure that we've been living under and, and what the repercussions of that are. And so I've been reading about possible solutions. That's why I told you I just started reading, you know, you yeah. know, all these great leaders and stuff like that. Um, to try to educate myself. I think right now is a time where everybody needs to listen mm. and educate themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of trying to talk over each other. Yeah. Um, or or try to argue a point that you're not gonna make in one argument, you know. So yeah. that's kind of what I'm trying to do right now, because as much as I go out there and speak, I don't want to be the source of bad information or miseducation, because yeah. then I would be doing everybody a, a, a disservice. And so for me to have this platform, I'm, I'm very um, fortunate that the people trust in my voice enough to hand me that power, because it's power that, you know, that's, it's, it's fragile thing to have in your hands, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't, and so right now I'm doing a lot of just trying to educate myself more on matters that I d have never known how to address before. I've known something was wrong or something needed to be said, but I didn't know exactly what the things were that were wrong or what the things were that needed to be said. So I'm, I'm still, you know, and, and I think I'll be doing this till I die, but the whole, you know, I'm still developing my own voice. Yeah, you're um, always growing and evolving. I think that's what being an artist is. I, you, you're always moving on to the next something the right. next version of yourself. And also, you know, there's a lot of young people out there, I noticed, and you're showing them how to be leaders. I think there, I, I've seen, from what I could tell, like there's young people that are stepping up. Um, my, our friend yeah. Denzel, he's stepping up into this role as an activist that, um, you know, he came into the Poetry Open Mic. He, we did him the typewriter talks. I think he was number eight or nine. He came into the Poetry Open Mic and he'd never written poetry before. You know, and, and and now he's you know, um, out there be leading through poetry, and you're showing these younger people how to be a good leader. And yeah, they're they I'm so powerful. proud. I'm so proud of our city. I'm so proud of our youth and how they have comported themselves um, in the past several weeks um, that I've been out observing. Yeah, it's it's really it's really impressive. I mean, the 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 young men that are you know, leading the march right now that are, that are literally the voices of this movement in St. Pete. They're young. I don't think yeah. they're, any of them are like older than 22 or 23 or something like that, you know? Um, you see marches getting, you know, put together by high school students, you know, mm -hmm. um, by college kids. And you're seeing that all over, all over right now. And I think that that's important um, because they need to know starting from early, that your voice is so necessary, yeah. it's so needed, and it's so valuable that you know it's 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 encouraging to to hear them speak out because we need their 
in platoon, we're fighting for their future, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. it's like, and I tell and I tell my kids every day, and they see me, they're like, you know, Dad, why, you know, there's COVID out there, there's this, yeah. there's that. I see what they're doing to protesters on TV, and I'm like, well, good. So it has to be done now, yeah, so that you don't have to live through the same crap that we've been fighting for centuries. You know what I mean? Um, so, so it's important, you know, and, and for him to see it too. And I let him know I'm trying to be as, as safe as I can. Yeah. But there, we need people putting themselves in the front line out there. To... Yeah, my daughter couldn't wait to go. She, she did the whole, she did the whole um, uh, trek. And uh, awesome. yeah, she was up, she was up there walking with Denzel, and um, right. she, she couldn't wait. I'm just like. That's great. That's I'm gonna do great. other things. I'm gonna do stuff behind the scenes because yeah, you know hey, everybody remember. has a different role. You know, exactly. everybody has a like. Yeah. We're getting books to get books to kids in the South Side St. Pete. We're doing writing classes. Like everybody finds their. I'm promoting stuff on social media. I'm having a lot of conversations with white friends. That is so important. And 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 you know, I had one friend that just kind of like, she got really triggered and didn't understand why and she really dove in and kind of saw where she was looking at things from a place of privilege and she's like you blew my head open like now she's an ally and she went and marched and you know those kinds of conversations are important too Absolutely. you know i was out uh, i was out yesterday um grabbing a bite and i was telling this the bartender there about you know the protest he was asking me he's like yeah. i live right there, like literally, I can see the protesters every day from out my window. Um, and then, but he's like, well, something I really don't understand is why yell Black Lives Matter? Shouldn't we be yelling All Lives Matter? And so this is a, you know, a discussion that you know, everybody has. Yeah. So I put it to him and I was like, uh, you know, I believe this is a, you know, like a parable in the Bible or something, but you know, Jesus has a hundred sheep, right? Mm -hmm. One of them goes astray. Now that one's by itself can't protect it's not in the herd it's not in the group right yeah. so you see the farmer goes and says all right i'm gonna leave you 99 sheep over here i'm gonna go help the stray one all right so that's what we're doing we're not gonna advocate for the 99 that are safe already yeah that are, you know that are already you know where they need, you know, need to be we're gonna fight for the one that the wolves are about to eat i love that yeah and, and so he heard that and he was just like can i march with you tomorrow and he came out today oops. yeah and, and yeah. he marched with, and he brought a friend See, that's, that's it, those kind of conversations. You know, and he, he went to the march and he loved it. He's like, I'm off of work the next four days. I'm going to be here every day. <laughs> that's awesome. when, I, when I left to come here, they stayed behind to do the seven o'clock march. So it's like, it's those little conversations that yeah. we need to get people to open up, you know, why these things are happening, why we're, we're out doing what we're doing, and why the importance of things like Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Um, that means to to our to not just the movement but to our humanity you know mm -hmm. so. so um where do you go for inspiration like if you get blocked you said reading um what other things i think my my biggest you know um it, it depends it depends you know sometimes i can't think of anything and i just need to like listen to music for a few hours and yeah. not just not even just to be inspired by the music, but to shut everything else out, yeah. you know? Because with music, sometimes you don't even have to, you know, be paying attention to it. It strikes a chord sometimes. Yeah. And and sometimes I just need a chord to be stricken for me to be able to. to yeah, I get it. Um, sometimes I really need my solitude. Yeah. I need to sit in my space in absolute silence and just let things, you know, be. I know those are usually the moments when I know I have something to say, but I'm just choked up. Yeah, and, I and feel like that when uh, before a poem. It's like I feel like it, I'm choked up. Like there's it is there's right. Like, it's like there's yeah. like rumbling. There's like something. It's like digestion, and then all of a sudden it's like oh, a poem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, it's really wild when that happens. Yeah. So, so there's there's different things. Um, sometimes I need to do something really physical. You know, wear my body down and let my mind be the energetic one and take over. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there, there are different techniques um, that I that I that I use. Um, conversations sometimes I could just you know I like I'm a very social person. 
Yeah. So I like to spark conversations. So I'll just, I'll call random people at random points just to have, you know, random conversation. And um, just to kind of remind ourselves of our interconnectivity that we've been neglecting, you know, like particularly during this COVID time, we need to let each other, we need to reach out to each other and, and be talking mm -hmm. to each other and conversations, you know. Um, no one likes to use the phone anymore, you know, everybody. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> I, I, tell, I tell my kid, don't date someone if they don't like to talk to you on the phone. <laughs> Because it's like so hearing someone's voice in your ear, it's so comforting. And it's, I, feel, I feel sad for if it's just this text generation and you're not actually hearing, like there's nothing I think more romantic than talking to someone at the, pho the phone when all the lights are out and you're just yep. like the voice on the, of the other person. Yeah. And not just that, it's important to hear each other's inflections. So when yeah. things don't get lost in, in translation, you can't, you can't get everything. You can't get the, the tonality of my message. Through it's a text. captive. It's like a captive audience. It's not right. text message or distraction. It's like you can't really be just distracted and talk on the phone. You have to like. Right, you know. right, right. So, so, um, what? One more question. What is your kind? Of, what is your holy grail piece of writing advice? Who? That's a that's a heavy question. I think. It would be find your voice and work on that. When, when you find something that really like you feel like that captured you, you know, and it, you know, it's very easy for writers to get discouraged when they're writing something and it doesn't come out right. It doesn't sound right to you. And it's easy to scrap it or just to put it aside and never look at that poem again. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, you get less and less of that the more confident or comfortable you become with your voice yeah. because you can always say okay i let it all out mm -hmm. now i'm going to find a way to mold it into my voice like yeah. those are my ideas they're out they sound like garbage right now you know <laughs> but i know what i'm trying to say now and now being comfortable with my voice i can find a way to say that so discovering your voice be passionate about your voice your voice matters you know um and and stick to it don't yeah. discourage yourself or let others discourage you, especially when you're still searching or trying to find your voice. You know what I mean? Um, because that's the easiest time for, you know, a young artist to get discouraged when nothing sounds like the way they, they hear someone else speaking. You hear me on the microphone. I want to sound like him. Do not sound like me. No. You no. Know, I want to, I want to be, you know, the next, you know, Saul Williams. I love Saul Williams, by the way. Um, <laughs> you can be Saul Williams. I wish I could be Saul Williams, but yeah. I got comfortable being me. And yeah. that's enough. So I think that that and keep that voice educated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important for young writers or any writer to realize like whatever you have to say, only you will say it in the way that you say it. And if you don't say it, it doesn't, the, the world won't have it. So it's important to understand that, you know, you have to keep honing your craft. And that is something that's nice about being in this for, you know, 15 or 20 years. And, you know, you know, you put it down and you're like, okay, this might not be something right now, but I could come back to it. Or maybe you can put these lines together with this line, or maybe this right. line will lead something instead of just going, this is horrible. That's one you know, thing that's really nice to be at this age, I guess. It so. is. And uh, I read this essay about Edgar Allan Poe and how he wrote um, The Raven. Mm. where he started the poem. He's, the first thing he wrote was the very climax of the poem, mm. led it to the end, and then came back and wrote the beginning. And and that that always fascinates me. You know, when, when you read that, that gives you another option. This is why I say I love you. got to read. You got you to educate yourself because you see these angles of approach here, right? Yeah. He starts from the exciting part. Those are here, and it's like, okay, how the heck do I get to there now? You know what I mean? I got I to gotta go back and redo that. And I've been catching myself doing that more and more. Um, where I'll have like a like a like a line going through my head, and I'll write down that line, and then I'm like, well, now I have to work my well my way to that line. <laughs> yeah. This line needs to be there. Yeah. So now I'm have to introduce this this notion so so that that line has its power and its place. And it's kind of cool. It's yeah. Approaching cool it from the other uh, side, you know. It's what I mean? cool that you're you know it's that's important to realize that your writing practice shifts. You know, like my writing yeah. practice is shifting now where it's, I'm getting ideas and I'm, I'm, I'm gestating on the ideas instead of waiting for the line of inspiration or, you know, it's, right. Just, right. It, and it's good to 
be, you know, flexible, that it's not like you might not be writing the same way when you're in your early twenties. And then if you have kids, like my poetry got really small because I only had certain amount of times with a, with a young child in the house. And then now it can get a little longer and it's good to know that, you know, that we're always evolving. It isn't just like set in stone. And, you know, um, and thank you for um, all that you shared with us because you're showing a whole different perspective. And then that's one reason we wanted to do this is that there's not one right way to be a writer. You know, right. there's, there's multiple ways. And we've had several poets on recently and what you're saying is very different than what they're saying. We all have different writing processes. So right. we want to hear your work. So can you share something with us? Okay, I will. I will share something for you. Um... I want to tell you a backstory to this poem, but I think the poem speaks its own backstory. So I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's called In What Way? One day a student told me there was no way I could feel them. There was no way I'd relate. I took this as a thinking there was no way I could heal them. There was no way we'd equate. So I asked them, in what way? They told me I had no idea what it's like to be poor. They told me I would never know what's hood. They told me I would never know what's hardcore. They told me no one ever understood. So I asked them, in what way? They told me no one understood the struggle. They told me no one understood their pain. They told me in a way that wasn't subtle that all us teacher people were the same. Mm. I asked them, in what way? Students soon grew weary of my questioning. They started asking questions of their own. They even asked me if I was arresting them. I said, my classroom's not a jail, it is a home. And I explained, I grew up with the poorest of the poor, where you don't expect to eat another day. Cause I was born into an ugly civil war in a third world country far away where eating beans and rice was a commodity, only if you had the means to get paid, getting where I got makes me an oddity. I too have faced some of these hardcore states. My parents left me when I was a baby. I had to flee my home when I was six. There are those who've lived the struggle daily, who have broken and are now ready to fix. I'm not your king. I don't expect you to follow me. You just don't need to question how far I've dealt. Because when I come into this classroom, I bring all of me the one who feels you, and the one who wants to help. Then my student asked me, in what way? Oh, oh my God, I, I, I got total goosebumps. Thank you. Thank you. That's so lovely. What a wonderful poem. You know what's really cool about this poem? Um, the, the student's getting ready to graduate from my school that I had this conversation with. When I wrote this poem, and I think it was maybe two years ago or something like that, um, right after I had this conversation with him, I wrote this poem and I posted it on my wall outside of my classroom. Mm -hmm. And he never noticed it was there. He never, you know, stopped it. And one day we were talking about something. He came at me and he was really agitated. And I said, I need you to read something. It might calm you down. And I brought him out and he's like, why you want me to read a poem? And I was just like, it's outside of my class. I was like, the, the, the your yeah, tension yeah. Is, was in there. So I'm going to ask you to step out and read this. He came back in my room with the biggest smile on his face. He knew right away who, what conversation that was. And he just came with the biggest cheese on his face. And he was just like, I remember that was our conversation, right? And I was just like, yes. And it, like his whole mood just shifted, you know? And he didn't even remember that he was upset. Aww. He went and told the principal, did you know Arkeen has his poem? Like, outside of his classroom, that, that was me. That's about me, you know? And he, he took ownership of that yeah. conversation and the beauty that, that happened in that moment. And it just completely changed his, his attitude around it. And, and you know, and that's, that's the power of poetry. Yeah. He felt seen and understood and heard. And he didn't even know that it had happened two years prior. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, but but it was a great moment. So it was like, it, you know, I, I didn't want, you know, that moment couldn't have been rushed and been the same. No. You know, it, it, it had to happen at that moment. And, and that's that's kind of, you know, part of the beauty in that, that I think that it was, it it had time to leave his memory. Yeah. And then it just re-sparked it like, wow. And he's at a way different point 
in his life now than he was a couple years ago when I wrote that poem. And just to see himself as like a backwards, like a back reflection of yourself, yeah. you know, you know, it's 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 important, you know, to to let them know, listen, I'm still hearing you. Yeah, and it's also timeless. Yeah. I mean, that piece is timeless. It's a timeless poem. You know, I mean, you can, you could, you could place, the, you know, replace the hood with anything, any kind of, any kind of oppressive situation that you've overcome and um, what it means to be poor. And uh, it's, it's kind of a universal concept of anybody that have lived through that kind right. of trauma. And um, right. that makes great poetry. That makes the goosebumps, you know, so thank you. And thank Absolutely. you for um, being here and thank you for being on the streets and still leading and inspiring our youth and adults. And um, yeah, I appreciate you being here and uh, I can't wait to see you out, and out and about, you know, with a mask on. <laughs> that's crazy times right now, but you know, that's what we wanted to do typewriter talks. Uh, we have a different writer that we feature every week. Um, and we wanted to kind of, you know, create a platform that writers work can still get out there, uh, even though we are right currently in COVID times. So um, please check out our website, keepstpetelit.org. We have online writing classes. We have poetry open mics, book clubs, all kinds of things. And Pedro- um, I, I also have uh, pedrothepoet.com if anybody wants to check out some of the music that I make and some of the you know stuff that I do with my, with my art. Um, I used to have pedroelpoeta.com, but the Chinese stole it from me. <laughs> and I think it's actually just, just because, yeah, like it, one day it was gone and it's a Chinese, it's all in Chinese. And I'm like, what is going on? Here? <laughs> I think I'm going to try to get that too and try to have the two websites combined. But right now, Pedro the Poet or Pedro Poet on any of your social media. We'll have um, his bio and link to his website below this video. So thank you so much. Thank you for turning, tuning in. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Um, yes. And uh, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Let's end with that, right? Okay. Thank Black you. Lives.